Aloha, and welcome back to the fifth episode of Talk Story with House Majority. My name is Della Albalati, and I serve as the House Majority Leader of the 30th State Legislature. We are in week 11 since the state stay-at-home orders were imposed on March 26, and at the yellow level of Act with Care. Next week, inter-island travel will, will begin and reopen without the 14-day quarantine. While state agencies are implementing a system of safeguards, beginning with thermal screening at the airports and health forms, our public health officials are working hard to strengthen contact tracing in anticipation of this increase in inter-island travel. Today, I will be joined by those leading the charge. We have Dr. Mm -hmm. Amy Grace, who is the Director of Health Science Policy at UH, leading the contact contact tracing collaboration with the Department of Health and a returning guest, Dr. Sarah Park, our state epidemiologist. Later, I'll be talking to Representative Tom Brower, chair of the House Committee on Housing, about short-term and long-term goals for his district of Waikiki. We'll also discuss the reconvening of the legislature on June 22nd. Be sure to comment, your, comment with your questions for our guest on the live stream featured on facebook.com olelo, facebook.com backslash Olelo community. So our first guest, welcome back, Dr. Yeah, Park. Dr. Park. <laughs> Thanks. What can a resident traveling into Ireland expect to experience when traveling between our islands to visit friends and family, you know, to go holo holo as we like to be here in the island? Yeah. So um, starting on uh, June 16th, next Tuesday, um, everyone who's traveling inter-island uh, will not be subject to the 14-day quarantine, assuming you're not you're one of our residents and you're not coming from out of state, right? Uh, I have to make sure everyone realizes that we don't have someone from California coming in and thinking they can travel inter-island. It's only for us, Kamaina, we can travel inter-island starting next Tuesday. Um, the only thing, though, is that we want to make sure we um, monitor closely for obviously um, any potential concerns um, and we want to protect Hawaii rate. So that means um, implementing a new health uh, travel health form um, and that will ask a few details about you know your contact information, where you're staying, things like this, but also some questions similar to what you might see in a doctor's office. When you go to your doctor's office, a lot of times you get handed a clipboard and they say, check off yes, no, do you have these symptoms or um, issues, right? And so it's a very simple, short symptom checklist, essentially, uh, a question about whether you've had flu vaccination, um, and that's pretty much it. Uh, and then that would be handed off to a screener, or the temperature screener, um, and they'll take your temperature. Uh, and then uh, depending upon how things go, you may be directed to a secondary screen, for example, if you have a fever. Um, but if you don't and you're healthy, you get to keep going on and hopefully everyone gets to enjoy visiting um, each other like we used to. That's pretty much it. And the other levels of kind of um, a screening will be the thermal screening at the airport uh, when you depart and as also when you arrive, is that both gonna happen? So just for the inter-island uh, part of the travel for this period of time, it's only the screening is only happening as you depart. Um, for people arriving from the mainland or for international still, believe it or not, there's still some travelers, um, they're, be being, uh, they're being subject to the thermal screen or temperature screen when they arrive. Somewhere down the road, um, it'll all be arriving passengers, no matter what, right? Um, but it won't be, inter-island screening won't be part of it. This inter-island, this is actually where we as a community can work together to help sort of work out the kinks of this system, um, because the hope is that this method of health screening will continue with arriving passengers when down the road we may be able to open up. And I want to just also say the governor is going to talk in much, much more detail about this at his 2.30 press conference. So please um, tune in to the governor then. Okay, so now what I'd like to do is, so we have the thermal screening, we have the health form. Now we really get to the meat of it, the contact tracing. And I'd like to play for our visitors a clip from the University of Hawaii and the Department of Health showing the kind of interaction that will occur between contact tracers and someone who may be COVID-19 positive. So this is a, a, a role play of what could happen if a contact tracer were to call you. Take it away, Alelo.
Hello. Hello, is this Mr. Jared Young? Yes, it is. Hello, Mr. Young. This is Michelle Bray calling from the Department of Health. Oh, hi. Hi, good morning. How are you doing today? I'm, I'm fine. Good to hear. I'm calling today to talk a little bit about the COVID-19 coronavirus. Can you verify your date of birth for me, please? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's um, January 6th, 1975. Thank you very much. Is this a good time to talk, by the way? Uh, yeah. Alrighty. So as a part of an investigation into a case of COVID-19, we are following up with individuals who was a close contact with the case, why they were possibly contagious. So I'm calling to check on you and discuss some public health recommendations. Sure. So right now, we know that you may have been exposed to COVID-19. We'd like to collect additional information to understand your risk. Uh, yeah, no, sure, whatever, whatever needs to be done. Thank you. So have you been feeling good? Can you tell me how you're feeling right now? Right now, I feel fine. I feel uh, normal. Any fever? No. How about shortness of breath? No. Cough? Coughing? No. Very good to hear. Well, since you have been exposed to someone with COVID-19, what that means is that we'll need to have you in quarantine for 14 days. 14 days? Yes, 14 days. So this means that you will need to stay in your home for the next 14 days because you were exposed to someone. Is there someone, a family member or a friend that can provide you with food or medications while you're in quarantine for those 14 days? Yeah, um, no, I have fr my family, my friends. I'm, yeah, I can, I can do this. That's good to hear. We'll also provide daily monitoring. Okay. So we'll have someone that will call you on a daily basis to see if you develop any symptoms. And also a letter will be sent to you based on the quarantine instructions. Oh, yes, all right. Do you have any questions at this point? Oh, well, not off the top of my head, but um, no, I, I can do this. And we will be calling you on a daily basis. So if you do have any questions, the person that calls you can go over your information with you and address any questions you have. Great, thank you for that. Now I do have specific questions that I need to ask you based on our COVID forms that I need to fill out. So do you have some time at this point to go over some information with me? Yeah, no, absolutely. Fire away. Alrighty. So the first question I'd like to ask you is, what is your occupation? Um, I'm a teacher. A teacher. Thank you. So what seems like a pretty simple interaction uh, on the part of a contact tracer really does require a lot of skill. It requires health knowledge, it requires empathy of the caller, and it also requires attention to detail and understanding of the health system's process. So that's where our next guest, Dr. Amy Grace, comes in. She's with the University of Hawaii, and she's really helping to administer the program that will bring and raise up the number of contact tracers we will have in the state of Hawaii. Amy, Dr. Grace, welcome to, to, uh, to Talk Story with House Majority. Can you share with us the role UH is playing in training contact tracers um, that we're going to need in the future? Sure, and thank you so much, Majority Leader, for having me on the show. It's really an honor to be here and with Dr. Sarah Park, with whom we've been uh, working closely on this DOH-UH contact tracing training program. We're really excited to be rolling out the program. Actually, our first cohort just started on Monday of this week. There are three different arms. We have a first track to train those with uh, health professional backgrounds, so those with clinical backgrounds. We also have a track that would train those that have undergraduate degrees but may not have clinical backgrounds. We also have an arm of the program that will train up more community health workers. What I wanna emphasize is that together, all of these arms of the program will help to create a robust surge capacity if the state needs it. So it really is going to be up to the Department of Health and according to how many cases we have about whether any of this trained workforce will be hired. But we really wanna make sure that we have trained them 
and that we want to make sure we have a statewide workforce. So we've been really pleased to have a lot of interest from those on the neighbor islands as well, because our programs are delivered online. And so we're excited to be able to represent the full state as much as we can in these training programs. So in the news, we always hear um, numbers of contact tracers that are going to be needed. Can you break down how many we're going to be training by each track? Yeah, sure. So our target is for 320 to be trained by track one, which is the clinical health professionals arm. We actually think we may get closer to 375 in that track. Uh, track two, we're aiming to uh, train 250 contact tracers over the next year. And the community health worker arm of the program, we aim to train 100 community health workers across the UH system over the next year. So I want to come back to the um, community health workers in a little bit, but I don't want to forget about the contact tracing trainers. You, you're saying about 300 um, by, by the middle of this year or mid-July. Mid um, who's going to be doing the training for that? Sure. So track one is being led by Dr. Christine Koreshi, who's our associate dean in the School of Nursing and Dental Hygiene at UH Manoa. I want to emphasize again that these programs are online. So while Dr. Koreshi and her team are leading the charge, uh, it's available to anyone. Uh, regardless, definitely don't need to have a UH affiliation and definitely, again, statewide. And again, that program is a one and a half day training for those who already have clinical backgrounds. And the reason is for that for that is because, as you saw in the video, it's really important to make sure you have empathy and maturity and a lot of those clinical skills that our clinical professionals already have. And hence, they're able to take an accelerated program. So Track two is a six-week training. Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, Talk about right. six-week training. And that's led by Dr. Rick Custodio at UH West Oahu. Again, another online program. But there's two courses there that will really cover a lot of the details to get folks up to speed, even if they don't have clinical backgrounds, about motivational interviewing, crisis counseling, connecting families with resources, all of those key clinical skills that we think are really necessary for contact tracers. And then that will complete with the one and a half day training like the track one folks received. Now, that, so really great. We're going to have maybe 500 people capacity if we need to surge from outside of the Department of Health for contact tracers, if there's clusters, as we see more travel um, beginning. Talk to me about the community health workers, because that is a really exciting part of the program um, that is actually an opportunity for folks to um, really maybe perhaps look for a, a career ladder step. Can you talk about that? Absolutely. We're thrilled about that aspect of the program. And I really credit Dr. Park with her vision and really seeing the importance of community health workers in our communities. You know, the contact tracers do a lot of their work from the phone, right? But we need people who are connected in the communities, who are trusted in the communities, who may come from those communities and also may speak the language of those communities that are most impacted or high risk. And so this program will, will really allow us to expand our training capacity so that we can graduate, again, 100 community health workers over the next year who can then be employed as needed, whether it's by the Department of Health or federally qualified health centers or the counties or others that can really use their services to serve as liaisons between our health systems and the community. So you know what, this is the perfect time to cut to Dr. Park and bring her into the conversation. Dr. Park, um, what what is for you as the epidemiologist of the state so unique and promising about the community health worker program? Well, I think um, over and over again in our investigations, and not just with COVID, um, I mean, we saw it with mumps, we've seen it with hepatitis A, we've seen it with so many other outbreaks and, and just day-to-day -day investigations. Um, there are parts of our community where we do struggle to reach them appropriately in terms of providing good education. Um, a lot of times when we provide that education on how to protect themselves and, and to protect the rest of the community from spread, um, you know, they have um, challenges in terms of socioeconomic challenges, other challenges. Um, there are language barriers, cultural barriers as well to get people to understand, you know, to what to us um, in the American culture might seem logical and another culture doesn't really make sense with how they, you know, how they normally interact with each other. Um, they may be more communal than we are. It's just so many different things and different perspectives, essentially. And that's where um, working with people such as community health workers who are really vested in the community, oftentimes speak the language, are even from the cultures um, that we're trying to reach, are really, really valuable in trying to have an effective um, sort of outreach 
um, prevent towards preventing um, further spread of the disease. So it's really, really critical to have these types of persons, not just employed by Department of Health, by the way, but also, also healthcare systems, other folks um, really to like, uh, as Dr. Grace has said, to really connect up our healthcare systems and the community. So this is a huge benefit that's going to actually be coming out of this. I think we will see healthier communities within our most vulnerable community, communities, because I know that people are concerned that say we were to see, start to see some positives um, in our homeless populations or our houseless populations, you know, containing that will be very difficult. But if we can contact trace that immediately with these trusted com community figures, we can really right. begin to contain. Um, yeah. So, so Dr. Grace, how many people have signed up for training and uh, what's been the response to the call for training by UH? Yeah, again, I want to reemphasize, as I have previously, I'm just so grateful for the community. We have had now almost 1,400 people sign up overall for this program. Very impressive. And I really want to thank our UH team and the DOH team who've been working around the clock to try to make sure we sort through all of these applications, put people in the right tracks, and get them started. Like we said, we already started uh, this past Monday. So we've had a significant amount of interest for both the clinical track and for the, um, the folks who don't have a clinical background. And uh, again, we're planning to uh, train about 374 through track one by mid-July 2020. And then we have hundreds more that are interested in the track two, but we're really trying to make sure that we have balanced classes. And again, that we make sure we have neighbor island representation and that we have those from our underserved communities as well. So again, this program is online. And we'll continue to, be, continue to be looking for applicants for our community health worker program. We've had hundreds interested there too, but we're continuing to look for more because we really think this is an exciting opportunity and a real career ladder for the future. So I got about three more minutes. Is there anything, Dr. Park, you want to say to our viewers uh, as we <laughs> reopen? And then maybe two minutes and then I'll give you one minute, um, Dr. Green. <laughs> Yeah, so even at, even before we've been reopening, I've been noticing in our community, a lot of us are feeling more relaxed and starting mm -hmm. to um, socialize, shall we say, more instead of physical distancing. And I think um, even now we are starting to see some of the numbers rise in terms of cases. Um, and I don't want to say that in, in terms of as an alarm, uh, but more as a reminder that, you know, unfortunately, this is the new world. This is the new normal is in that there will be COVID cases even before we reopen. There will be definitely uh, more COVID cases as we do reopen. Um, number one, our community should not be alarmed by that. It's it's expected. Um, but it also, number two, is a reminder for all of us that all those safe practices that we've been recommending, you know, the physical distancing for those, you know, physical distancing with those outside of your bubble, you know, outside of your day in, day out persons that you're always interacting with, whether it's your Ohana bubble or your work Ohana bubble, um, you know, those are things that we need to think about physical distancing, the masks, you know, when you're in crowded settings or potential to interact with people, again, outside of your bubble, wear those masks because it is, it, it, data is showing it does help. So um, it's something to think about. And then hand washing and then not touching your face with dirty hands and then sanitizing surfaces. And by the way, on that last one, the cleaning frequently, we're not saying like go around with a wipe and follow everyone around and wipe constantly. I mean, that that's not what we're saying at all. What we're saying is more daily cleaning, you know, I'm sure there are many of us who have been guilty of not uh, cleaning our surfaces maybe for weeks on end, you know, and saying, oh, yeah, I'll get to that. But really what we're saying is cleaning those frequently touched surfaces on a daily basis um, and obvious spills. Nothing more than that. I mean, we're not talking about suddenly chemicals everywhere and cleaning everything up the wazoo. Um, so things in re within reason, but again, safe practices, especially as we open up. And I'll, I'll put a pitch in because you didn't say this. If you're sick, stay home. Thank you. <laughs> well, I guess I'm assuming that. So maybe I shouldn't assume that. So, <laughs> Dr. Grace, you want to say anything last about UH Contact Tracing? It's really an amazing program. Thank you for partnering with DOH. Okay. Yeah, and no, I really, again, want to thank Dr. Sarah Park and her team. This has been a really wonderful collaboration with the Department of Health. And I have the privilege of leading the You Healthy Hawaii Initiative, which aims to leverage the UH system to improve health and healthcare in Hawaii and the Pacific. And we're excited that this program can be part of it. We're also really excited to partner with so many of you in the community, our colleagues at HPU, at Chaminade, and again, across the state and on our neighbor islands. So if you're interested in uh, hearing more, 
please uh, email us at oshi at hawaii.edu and oshi at hawaii.edu. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Grace, Dr. Park. Love to have you on this show. Um, as they're as they're transitioning out and Representative Brower is coming in, I'd like to ask Olelo to just flash on um, that map. You know, Hawaii is one of 14 states that is partnering um, to bring up this contact tracing program. And I personally believe it's really important because as we partner, we're really surging from within. And um, that is uh, allowing us to make better use of our resources. And as you can see from the program that was described by Dr. Grace and Dr. Park, we really are upgrading the skills of our community and strengthening our healthcare network um, statewide. So with that, I mean, you know, again, I think Hawaii is in the right in the right place, partnering to build up its contact tracing program. Mm -hmm.